And how many books have you written so far? Well, the ones that have real text and words and are not just comics, I think yeah. there are nine of them. Nine books. Different types. Some about the workplace and humor, two about or, or fiction uh, revolving religious psychology. The latest one, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big, is um, a book about success. Mm -hmm. And there are a few other miscellaneous in there. How many of those books actually reached the, the New York Times bestseller list? bestseller list? Several of them did. Okay. And then some other ones reached within categories. Um, so the, the How to Fail book is often number one in its category, even now a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are, I don't know, there must be close to 40 reprint books that are just the comics that have already run. Wow. So 10 years ago, you reached what you described as fuck you money. <laughs> yes. What did that mean to you? What, what is fuck you money, according to Scott Adams? Well, this, this concept comes from uh, the regular workplace, you know, from, uh, I think, finance people came up with it first. And the idea is that once you have enough money that you don't need a boss, nobody can tell you what to do. You know, the, the public can't stop buying your product and hurt you because you have enough money already. Your boss can't fire you because you don't need him. So you're not really free until you can say fuck you to all your customers and your boss. Okay. Right? Now, I don't say that to my customers because I, you know, I'm just appreciative every day that they care about anything I do. Mm -hmm. But I can. <laughs> I can. And if anybody follows me on Twitter, they know I do on a regular basis about 25 times a day. There's somebody who just, who just deserves to be uh, you know, given that treatment. But you didn't necessarily have a boss for a long time, though. I mean, you, were, I mean, you worked with this company, but you're creating your own product, and, and the product is rolling along. Yeah, I use boss loosely to mean yeah. any, anybody who can control your fate. But uh, yeah, whether it's your specific boss or just people who control you. Right. Now, when you, when you talk about fuck you money, are you really talking about, I no longer have to work for the rest of my life, and I can still maintain the kind of lifestyle that I want? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's sort of a, a loose, loosely defined thing that's going to be different for everybody, but everybody has in their mind, if I made this much money, I would never work again. Yeah, until you get used to a certain kind of lifestyle and you realize that's not going to work anymore. So I made that much money and I said, uh, I'm free, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never need more money or anything. I'm at four times that now. Mm -hmm. Still don't feel any closer to quitting <laughs> because... The work has its own benefits, and, and like you said, you reach a, a certain lifestyle, and you're you're helping a number of people around you, which is more rewarding actually than, you know, I'm not very materialistic beyond my house, uh, so it's hard to stop because there's so many rewards. Um, so even though you can, and I guess that's part of the benefit of it, uh, the, you know, the joy of work is far better when you don't have to do anything the way anybody else tells you to do it. What do you think, you know, in terms of your life, was the greatest thing that you got from having a certain amount of money? My best luxury from having money is the house I'm sitting in right now. Um, you haven't seen it, but one of the rooms in my house is a full indoor tennis court. So okay. I'll, I'll show you that after. Okay. Um, tennis was my big sport for most of my life. Hmm. And I always dreamed that if I ever made it, I would have my own tennis court. At the time, I wasn't thinking indoors, but uh, Charles Schultz had, has had an indoor tennis court. And I saw it once, I was like, ah, got to have one of those. So that probably was the most meaningful thing. Wow. So your last book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big, did I say that right? <laughs> you did, yes. So, so th this was actually something that I have been really preaching for a long time. And uh, I mean, I was actually thinking one day maybe I'll write a book about it, but clearly you've, you beat me to it. But what I realized in my own life is that you grow up with this, with people telling you, don't quit, never give up. You know, the, the winners are the people who stuck through it. When I actually took a step back and looked at my own life and looked at how many times I changed my career and had to pivot, you know, like I went from you know, first of all, going to Berkeley, not knowing what I was going to do, to choosing computer science, to being a programmer, then not, you know, 
realizing that I don't want to be writing code all day, to starting my own recruiting agency, to you know, the dot-com collapse, wiping out that agency, to becoming a DJ, to becoming a filmmaker, to where I am today with Vlad TV, where it's almost 10 years, where I'm kind of combined a whole bunch of these things into one, into one thing. And I've had success in, in a lot of these. But yet, I had to tell myself, I am quitting. <laughs> so I do talk about knowing when to quit. And I do list all of my failures, of which there are dozens. Mm -hmm. um, but I think of it as a system versus a goal. And that's what the, the main theme of the book is. And what you described was a perfect system in which I call, I call that system um, talent stacking. So what you did is you combined talents in a way that were close enough or related to each other that they were complementary. Mm -hmm. So you became more valuable not just because of a single thing you could do, but you had a combination of things which gave you unique capabilities. I'm sure, for example, that your technical knowledge helped you be a DJ. You said that passion is actually overrated. Yeah, so if, if you talk to a billionaire, uh, as often happens, when a billionaire gets interviewed, somebody's gonna say, what was your secret to success? And what do these billionaires always say? Whether it's uh, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, um, Richard Branson, they all say the same thing. They say passion, follow your passion. That's, that's what makes everything work. Here's the problem with that. Think what else they could have said instead of that answer. Mm -hmm. Could they say, well, I'm a billionaire because I'm smarter than poor people. Right. Can't say that, even if it's true. Right. Because in those, at least two of those guys, that might be true, <laughs> right? You know, Bu Buffett and Zuckerberg are way smarter than ordinary people. Yeah. They can't say, I worked hard, because their gardener works harder than they do, right? It's not helping them become a billionaire. So if you look at all the answers they can actually give, they can't say luck, because then nobody wants to work with them. It's like, well, you just got lucky once. Like, <laughs> you know, what are the odds that happens again? Yeah. So they say the only democratic thing they can say, passion. And you know why they say that? Because they think, you think you can get that. If, if they said, it's because I'm smart, other people go, ah, darn, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm not smart. You know, there's nothing I can do. So I hate the billionaire, because he's got something I don't have. But the billionaire cleverly says, no, don't eat me, because I know if, if the poor people get mad enough, they're just going to cannibalize the rich. Don't do that. Instead, <laughs> find your passion, and you can have what I have. It's complete bullshit. Um, in my experience, I get passionate about things that work. <laughs> Always. If it works, I get pretty excited about it. Right. But like I said, there were dozens of things I tried that didn't fail because of my passion wasn't enough. There was something about the environment, something changed. You, know, you gave the example of you know, one of your businesses got you know, eaten by the dot-com bubble exploding. Mm -hmm. I had that same situation with some stuff. These are things you don't control, right? So you gotta try a lot of things until uh, luck can find you. But when something works, you get pretty excited about it. And I actually had a, a boss when I was a banker, commercial lender, who said, uh, specifically, he said this. He said, if somebody comes in for a loan for their favorite thing, like somebody likes sports, so they wanna start a sporting goods store, don't give that person a loan, because they're not here for the right reason. They're here for passion. And that's not who you want to give a loan to. Because the, the guy who you want to give a loan to comes in and he goes, I want to start a dry cleaning franchise, you know, be a franchisee for a dry cleaning store. Totally boring. He has no interest in it whatsoever. But he's done three businesses like this, and they all worked. He knows how to hire people. He's willing to put in the hours. He's got a spreadsheet that shows you the numbers. No passion at all. He's just got a really good idea. And you know that he can execute. Give that guy the loan. Well, you said that if Dilbert didn't make millions of dollars, you wouldn't have been all that passionate about it. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's just hard work and it's sitting alone in a room and you know, doing this for hours at a time. But, but what about, like, for example, like, you know, Malcolm uh, Gladwell has the whole outlier philosophy. You read his book? I, I have, yes. And, and his thing is that the people that are really successful, when you look at the Bill Gateses, the Warren Buffetts, the LeBron Jameses, um, you know, various athletes, the reason why they got to where they, you know, where they got to was because 
they started so early and devoted so much time and were so neurotic about actually pursuing certain things that by the time they reached a certain age, they had so much more experience than everyone else around them that they naturally just kind of rose to the top. I totally, re totally reject that view of the world. Really? Um, no matter what had happened in our, in our history, somebody would be the richest person. And probably they didn't do anything that our current richest people did. I mean, I'm just imagining a different world. So if you have people with different outcomes, someone's going to be at the top. And the mistake that we always make is to say, what that guy did must be what works. And it isn't the case. It just worked that particular time for that particular person in this particular situation. So it's largely luck that people were doing the right things at the right time. Now, for every Bill Gates who was in there early, very smart, worked very hard, all, whatever checklist you want to say about him, there were 25 others doing the same thing. Yeah. Just as smart, same place, doing the same stuff. They didn't become Bill Gates. So every time you dig down into somebody's specific success and you're trying to say, ah, oh, three of these guys did the same three th same things, then you write a business book about it, it's always magical thinking because somebody's, somebody's going to succeed. It's a, let me give you an analogy. In evolution, we used to think it was survival of the fittest, right? That the, the traits that got carried on were the ones that were survival related. Now that's been updated, right? Now the current thinking is the things that survived are just the things that didn't get killed. Hmm. So maybe you survived not because you had any great characteristics, you just were in an environment that didn't have tigers. <laughs> it was just luck. So a lot of success is just pure roll of the dice. And then, you know, afterwards people want to put a filter on it and say, what are the reasons you're successful? And you can never duplicate it. I mean, that's your tell that it's not real. You can't duplicate it. Well, I don't think you could, you know, like, let's just say the, if we take a music analogy, you can't duplicate a one hit wonder. Right. Right. In, in music, anyone, and I, I mean anyone, can create a hit record. The musical ability, the training, the person's voice, all that does not matter. Like, I've seen it over and over and over again by completely untalented people. They <laughs> create a, a very catchy song or they have a certain look or they have something that just resonates with the audience. It's a, it's a million monkeys with typewriters. Yeah, exactly. They'll, they'll, they'll create Shakespeare. If you have an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of typewriters, they will eventually create Shakespeare. But a lot of those monkeys are going to write a hit song before anybody does Shakespeare. Right. <laughs> but when you look at the Little Waynes, the Jay-Zs, the Bob Dylans, the, the Beatles, the, the Michael Jacksons, there's a specific reason why they've been able to create hit record after hit record after hit record after hit record. The princes, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. These are not the same people who are creating the let, one hits. Let me test that. Okay. Why, why do they all stop after the age of 40 or so when you would think their talents are at their highest? I've always wondered about that. Right? <laughs> I've always wondered, yeah, I wonder why Bob Dylan stopped making hit records. He still makes music. Lots of music. He's, uh, and, and, you know, uh, when was the last time McCartney had a, a major hit? And who has more skill, resources, good ear, every possible checklist thing you could think of? McCartney has 10 times more than anybody else. Why doesn't okay. he still put out hits? And, and the answer is that there's, a, there's something about the environment and the artist that has to match. Hmm. All right? And as people age out, you know, they're, they're no longer matching the environment in, in whatever way, either physically, by age, they're not appealing to young people, that might be part of it, but they may just not be tuned in anymore. Like, they, they don't feel the angst, they're not hungry, they're not in pain. But they're rich. Rich is a real problem with creativity. Yeah. I gotta say, because being um, hungry and angry is really good for creating, yeah. really good. So I, I actually have to artificially generate anger for creativity sometimes. Really? Yeah, it's partly why I spend so much time on the internet and on Twitter. It makes me angry. And <laughs> okay. It, it gives me a lot of, a lot of energy. Um, but it's also why I have a startup. Because the, the startup 
allows me to be connected with like real problems of real people, you know, little little problems that you know you shouldn't have when you're rich. But I got lots of them, <laughs> and so they're frustrating, and so I have stuff to write about. So I guess there's one luxury that I allowed myself when I built this house. I decided to put one room in it that's a little bit surprising. And this is my uh, indoor tennis court. It's a full tennis court, regulation size. Just happens to be in my house. I saw that uh, Charles Schultz had an indoor tennis court years ago and I thought to myself, I gotta get one of those. Now uh, my dog likes to use it for fetching. Hold that, hold it. <laughs> That's it.